we rather have someone commit to an action than not to commit to an action. We already know that. We've talked about that many times before. But when you cross into being that supervisor role, um, it, it's going to be a mixture of natural ability uh, mixed in with whatever skill you develop along the way. How are you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. Today, we're going to talk about qualities that make for a good, decisive, decisive supervisor. It's a great discussion because I know a lot of us right now are dealing with supervisors that are indecisive. So today I thought we could talk about qualities that lead to a good, decisive supervisor. So if you have that supervisor that you feel is indecisive, send them the link to this video or send her the link to this video. Sorry. Supervisors come in both shapes, male and female, both genders, male and female. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Hey. So just start. Let's see where it goes now. Hey, guys, uh, Connie Eileen is going to join in on this discussion. It's going to be a great discussion. We're going to share some insight on what we believe can help supervisors become more decisive uh, when they deal with the chaos, the chaos that occurs in corrections. Hey, guys, by the way, the show is sponsored by three entities. We have American Military University. If you guys are looking to get that degree, looking to bring some experience into the classroom, American Military University is a great place to go. Uh, they've been supporting me since day one. They've been supporting the field of corrections since before I can even, you know, before I even had them as help here. Uh, they've been with us for quite some time. So if you guys get a chance, please check out American Military University. It's a great school, great online school. And we also have Guardian RFID uh, from inmate tracking and cell checks to cloud-based businesses and artificial intelligence. Guardian RFID digitally transforms jails prisons and juvenile detention facilities of every size. Visit guardianrfid.com for more information. Guys, if you go to that website uh, or you go to their YouTube channel, Guardian RFID YouTube channel, you'll see that we have videos out there as well. It's called On The Line. We produce a lot of content for that channel as well, a lot of good tips. So if you get a chance, check it out. And we also have the RAP, W-R-A-P, uh, controlling combative subjects quickly in an upright position so they can breathe has never been more important. Departments such as Washington, D.O.C., L.A. County, San Diego County, 100 other facilities across the U.S. trust and believe in the RAP restraint. Go to saferestraints.com for contact information. I mentioned here, talk to receive instructor training at no cost. Lower liability for your facility and your personnel with the RAP. Give the RAP a call today, 1-800-WRAP-911. Guys, if you don't know what the RAP is, there's a link to a video in the description of this video. Uh, get a chance, please check it out. Guys, guess who I have? As I said, well, I already said it, so no sense of guessing it. I'll just bring the person on. Her name is Connie Eileen. Connie, what's going on? How you been? Hey, everything's good. Everything's good. I can't complain. Um, we did actually go ahead and find that uh, jersey that I was looking for. <laughs> so it's, it's a good it's a good night. Um so Connie Eileen here. I am the founder and president of the Civilian Corrections Academy. I'm also the podcast host of The Fly Behind the Wall and the author of The Cage Was Her Cocoon. The Fly Behind the Wall season three will be coming soon. I am, I am beginning to work on it as I carve out some time for it. And Ganji will be my first guest. Um, we have a few we have a few topics that we'll cover. Um, he doesn't even know that yet. I got to check my calendar. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we got that on its way. But I am super excited about talking about our topic tonight because indecisive bosses can make life very hard. So I think it's a matter of sometimes just strategizing on how to work with them. Or sometimes it's working around them. But... We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Yes, guys, this is actually, a, as I said, a very needed discussion because we do have a lot of supervisors that, you know, they, they, they kind of, in my opinion, it really does start with the reasons that they become a supervisor. Um, for me, I became a supervisor at first for the wrong reasons. I'll be honest with you. Uh, I didn't want certain people becoming my supervisor. So that kind of was the, it, it was a bad motivation, but it did motivate me. Uh, but ultimately the final decision when I decided to really move up was the responsibility that I'm going to have over the people I supervise and the responsibility I'm going to have towards the, you know, towards the agency. 
obviously, because when you start moving up, you become more trusted. I mean, think about that, guys. As you move up, you're getting trusted now with a bigger area of control. But more importantly, you're overseeing people who oversee the inmates. And that's at, at each department, you know, as, as you move up through the levels. So for me, um, right off the bat, I think that when you're, when you're about ready to become a supervisor, what's motivating you to take that position can kind of tell us who you're going to be when you're in that position. So again, if it's more, I'm internal, going to make a difference. I'm, I'm not afraid of that taking, taking that responsibility. You know, that's a great way to start. But if it's more of, I'm doing it just for the extra bucks and, you know, um, whatever other incentives there can be that are external, that may not be enough to hold you during those tough times when you have to step up and take responsibility. Right, Connie? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, sometimes when we step into these management roles or we start to move up the ladder, you know, we don't realize just how much responsibility, you know, comes along with those roles, what the level of accountability that comes along with those roles. And I think the more that we get deeper ingrained into those new roles, um, we our eyes are open, right? And, you know, as much as like, I have like some strong feelings um, when it comes to indecisive bosses, particularly in this environment, I, I, I must have, I, maybe I have a soft heart when it comes to them because I know that a lot of times that indecisiveness comes from being burned in the past. That indecisiveness sometimes comes from, you know, I learned from, you know, the mistake I made previously. Um, I wasn't supported when I made a decision last time, you know, the so so sometimes, so there's some people who just are on the fence about everything and they just can't make a decision or they don't have enough information. And so instead of admitting they don't have enough information, they kind of straddle the fence and frustrate everybody, right? You've got those. But then you have those who are kind of thinking a little ways down and they're like, listen, if the outcome is negative or if it's not favorable, then I have to deal with whatever those consequences are. And so suffice it to say, as we step up into these managerial roles, administrative roles, it's understanding there's a level of accountability that comes with that and every decision that you make. So being indecisive is really not an option, especially when you have, you know, your people who are looking to you for guidance. They are looking to you for what is the next step? You know, what would you want me to do? They're looking for those directives from you. And so certainly, um, yeah, it's 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 one of those that like I'm really feeling some kind of way about the indecisive boss who kind of leaves you on the front line to make a decision and then doesn't support you if the outcome isn't favorable. But we didn't get there yet. I'm ready, though. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm just listening. I'm just. Just <laughs> caught up in the awe that is Connie Eileen. Uh, so, so, but, but you know what, Connie, you, you did hit up on some good points there. Uh, one of the things here, guys, is we rather have someone commit to an action than not to commit to an action. We already know that. We've talked about that many times before. But when you cross into being that supervisor role, um, it, it's going to be a mixture of natural ability. Uh, mixed in with whatever skill you develop along the way. I think a lot of people, if they're positional, they tend to move up and think that's it, done learning. No, you have to continue to learn and you have to continue to be open to what you can learn, not just from the environment itself, your experiences, but also from the people that you supervise. You have to be willing to learn. So as you move up, it is, it's still a growing position. So again, I think, I think if you're open, because we're not going to be perfect going in, we're going to make mistakes, we get that. And you can't, this is a crazy thing, but I'm going to tell you something, guys. You can't be afraid to make mistakes. Uh, I, I know that's hard to say when you have the pressures of above, uh, but, but that is the best advice I can tell you right now. You know, you can't be afraid to make a mistake. I, I think John Maxwell says when we fail, we, we fail forward. But most of the things that you're going to learn are from the mistakes that you make. So mistakes can be very constructive in nature but if you're afraid like to make a decision because you're afraid that you're going to make a mistake you got to eliminate that right off the bat because we are going to make mistakes i mean if that's the case then you're never going to make a decision i mean 
I got almost 20 years in now and I still make mistakes, you know, but that doesn't stop me from making a decision and then, you know, dealing with, with, with the consequences that have be, but the greater consequences and Connie, just to reiterate is not making a decision. Correct. I mean, you have to be willing to step up and if there is a mistake, you have to be willing to make that mistake it, it, just to get the decision you, out there. You right? got to be willing. Some someone has to decide, right? And some some situations that present, there is no we could just not do anything, right? It it's go time, right? Whatever that that situation is in the moment, someone has to go either way. I think one thing that really just crossed my mind as you were talking about it was, you know. Um, in that space of here it is, there's a decision that needs to be made, right? Even if you make the decision and it, it there's a negative outcome, there's an unfavorable outcome, it's just knowing that you used all of the information you had available to you at the time, right? And yeah, hindsight is always 2020, right? So if you don't do anything, you still aren't using the information you have in front of you where you can make the best decision possible based on what you know, right? There's always going to be something else that pops up. You could have, could have, could have, could have. Everybody could have done something else, right? But at the end of the day, this was a decision you made with the information that you have. And as long as you know you, you thought critically about that decision before kind of just jumping into it, like you have to be okay with where the chips are going to fall. You didn't do anything malicious. You didn't ignore anyone's great counsel. You weren't necessarily um, trying to just do things and, and just and do it in isolation or do it in a vacuum, right? And I think those are some of the good qualities that we're probably going to be talking about as we move forward that, you know, when you have a decisive leader that person is going to say, okay, here's the information we have. They're going to tap into the talents, the skills, the knowledge that they have access to. They're going to make a decision. This is the decision that I made, right? And they're going to take responsibility for that. They're not going to be looking to say, oh, but this one told me to do that or that one told me to do the other. You know, it's like, hey, take the leap. And, and suppose everything works out great, right? What happens then? Because right? that's the way I look at it. Sometimes it's like, oh, I would have never even thought of that. Right. And here it is. You could be pioneering something and you don't even know because you're afraid to make a decision with what you know. Connie, you're actually tapping into one of the bullets. I'm going to get to that one first. I have a few bullets want to cover, but uh, I'm going to get into one of the bullets that Connie just discussed. But but briefly, but, but real quick. So uh, one of the things as a supervisor, I like to think that when you're moving up, there's some natural ability for you to lead. I, I really do believe mm -hmm. that in corrections in general, you need leaders at every level, 100 percent, because of the work that we're doing. We need people that are willing to make uh, decisions, step up, you know, take the ball and run with it. And again, it doesn't mean you have to be strong in every area as we complement each other. I mean, you know, it is what it is. I mean, we're going to have certain people that are better at this than, than that. And what we do is we tend to work together to get ourselves a full team. But one of the things that uh, I was reading about was natural ability and learned skills. The key thing about learned skills is that as a supervisor, you have to continue to learn, which means that you're going to have to make decisions that take you out of your comfort zone. Because if you don't do that, you're never going to learn. So, you know, if, if there's concerns that are happening and the whole world's in chaos around you, you can't freeze. Uh, it's like what me and Connie have been saying. You got to step out, make that decision, bring you right out of the comfort zone, and then sit back later on when everything's done and kind of reevaluate. Because one of the things that we talked about, it's not just experience, it's evaluated experience. It's yeah. going back and evaluating your experience and saying, okay, well, you know what? These are the things I could have done better. Uh, these are the things that actually went pretty well. Uh, and, and the thing is, if you guys don't take the effort to do that, then you yourself are not growing. But again, you got to make the decision in order for you to start stepping out of that comfort zone. So you definitely don't want to freeze. Now, I'm going to, I had some bullets in order, but I, I'm going to actually um, move them around a little bit because Connie jumped up on something that I want to, uh, I don't know if Connie realized it, uh, but a good supervisor knows their resources. Connie actually mentioned when, you know, again, a, a quality of a decisive leader has to know their resources. So if I'm in a situation and everything's chaotic in front of me, now mind you guys, listen, let me just say one thing real quick. When you're a supervisor, 
uh, and you're making your decisions, even when you're a front line, but, but more so, I, I guess, when you're that supervisor and you're responsible for other people, experience is going to come through. Before you even understand what the hell is going on, your gut's going to be talking to you and kind of giving you some direction mm-hmm. because in some cases there is some automat- automaticity to what we, what we do and how we react. Now, you don't want to ignore that. You want to listen to that. But most of the time, guys, the sad thing is, is that when we're trying to figure out what this big picture is that's happening, we act on pretty much 40% of what our experience is telling us. And, and the other 60%, we have to figure it out later. Uh, but the key, guys, is when you have good intuition, you act and then explain why you act later on. Like, I don't have time to tell you why I'm doing it this way. I just know it and I'm going to do it. And then later on, when you have time, you can sit down and express your thoughts to whoever it is that's got to hear what it is. But but again, if, if you're sitting there waiting too long to try to gather the facts and ignoring the intuition, you're never going to solve anything. Sometimes you got to listen to that gut when you only know 40% of what's going on. And then later on, I'll explain what made me go on that. But if I wait to figure out all the pieces, I'm never going to act. So Connie mentioned the resources. I, I believe that good supervisors know where all their resources are at every time. So it makes it quick for them to make a decision. And, and Connie mentioned something quick, so I'll Connie take the ball on this one. But resources are your people too, correct? I think people don't realize that. Absolutely. So I think what oftentimes people think, especially when they step into these roles, I got to know everything. I've got to be all knowing. And that's just not the case, right? And so a lot of times we're presented with these situations that seem like an anomaly. Wow. I've worked here all these years. I've never had this experience before. Okay. Who do I need to call in order to get some more insight into this? And like, that is the thing, like the resources are the people who work close to the situation. They, they're the ones who are in the facilities. They're the ones who, you know, all right, let me call intake. This is who I know deals with this. Oh, let me call over here to, you know, um, let me call this housing unit, right? I dealt with officer so-and-so before, and he was able to connect me to this person, right? Oh, let me call the security depth. And I think what we don't realize is that we probably do that innately, Like if you in the facility and you just kind of doing and when that intuition is like, oh, I know who I need to call. You may not have all the details, but knowing the right people to call, knowing where to get the information. How do I gain access to this? Who do I need to speak to to gain access to this? Those are the ways that we tap into getting all we need in order to make the best decision we can in the moment. Yeah, guys. And. When, when we talk about uh, good supervisors know their resources, it kind of, kind of brings us to another bullet. Good supervisor knows their people. So I, I know one of the things is we tend to have supervisors that even when they say they're managing by walking around, they kind of speed walk in. We want managers that do a slow walk, get to know their people, understand what their strengths are, see how best they complement the team. And then you go ahead. And, and, and I think by the more you know the people, the more it helps you make a decision during those rough times. Mm-hmm. Because like Connie said, you know which people you can go to. You know which people are strong in these areas. And I noticed something too, guys. When you have people that have certain strengths in certain areas, that adds to the intuition behind what the team is acting on. Because again, we may be put into these scenarios where we have to figure out things on the fly. But for the most part, if we know where we can apply our people at their best strengths, and their best positions, then besides our intuition, we could also lean on the genius of the other people who have been put into that position because that's where their greatest strength is. So think about this, guys. We're giving not just ourselves the best ability to control the situation, but we're also giving the people we supervise the best chance to control the situation. The more you know your people during that emergency time, the more you can place them and say, hey, Connie, you're good at this. Go do what you got to do. And Ganji, you got this. Go do what you got to do. And you put everybody in their areas of, of strength, it gives everybody a chance to kind of step up, you know, kind of kind of lean towards the best solution possible where we're the most effective. And also, I mean, I mean, Connie, but like you said, you can't do that unless you're out there, first off, understanding who your people are. But second thing is, is testing the waters sometimes. You know, I mean, if you're not, making any decisions and you're allowing this stuff just to occur, you don't know what's best for your people. But when you start making that decision, part of that decision is, you know what? These are the people I need. This is where they're best at. And let's go ahead and let's solve this problem 
you know, the best way we can by by putting our people where they're the most effective. Would you would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I I say it all the time, right? Like you can't manage from behind your desk, right? And unless you get up and you're doing that slow walk and you're getting to know your people, not just like those drive-bys, right? Like cuz I've experienced the drive-by and there's times where I didn't have the time to actually do a slow walk where I've done the drive-by, right? But I think there's the intentionality behind getting to know your people, understanding their skills, getting to know what they're great at. You know, when you first mentioned that, the first thing I th thought about was um, I remember us responding to a code. It was someone who was in a diabetic crisis. And there was a nurse who always ran our diabetic clinics. And she she just, she for some reason, it was almost like she had a photographic memory. She knew what insulin this guy was on. She knew like all these minor details. And I knew that about her. And I was like, oh, go call, go call Jones, right? The, the, her name wasn't Jones, but I'm just throwing it out there. Go call Jones. Let her go with us to the code, right? Like, so we respond like you're supposed to respond. And then Jones comes because she knew this person intimately and the time it was going to take for us to figure out how to stabilize this person and what was going on. She had all this knowledge already there. And it's like, if you didn't know that Jones had that information, they had that insight, the outcome could have been worse. And I think that's the thing too, like as, as leaders, as managers, we have to be able to say, I don't know it. I know who does know it, or I don't know it. It doesn't diminish me as a leader because I need to depend on someone else's skill in order to get us to where we need to be. Yeah. And you know what, Connie, when you think about something too, as we're discussing, we're talking about pe playing people's position. Think about if we know what position they're the best at, then mm -hmm. once we get them there, that's the less we have to delegate. Because think For about sure. that. If you, but I mean, I mean, it makes sense to me. Like if I'm a supervisor, I kind of want, you know, and let's say we're going through this chaotic moment. I kind of want things to run as smoothly as possible. So when I put people where they need to be, I don't have to micromanage them. I know that they're going to make the decisions to get the job done. But if, if, if I'm putting people where, where they're at, but they're unsure of the position themselves, or that's not where their strength is, because I can have a strong player here, but not so good here. Then you mm -hmm. wind up having to kind of make more decisions for them. It's like, you know what, man, it, it just becomes too complicated where I can know that, hey, by the way, this guy's great at searches. Go do that. And, and this guy mm -hmm. can definitely de-escalate. Go do that. And then you can kind of sit back and, you know, let this run its course because you know you have the people that are the best for that job. Does, does that make sense? That also relates to yeah. your story, correct, a little bit? No, Jones that, that Jones. absolutely makes sense, for sure. I agree. I mean, I, I think that it's many of the chaotic situations that we find ourselves in like can sometimes be very overwhelming, right? Even for the even for the manager who is decisive, right? So let's just not even throw someone in there who's not the best at making decisions, right? But when you do have people who know their positions and can play their positions, it makes it so much easier for you to work through all the other chaos that's going around. Like that's one less thing you have to think about, one less factor you have to take into account because you know you got a solid person playing that position and they got that under control. And I think there's no better feeling of, um, I don't want to say relief. It's almost like a, a feeling of comfort almost that like, all right, I got the right players in place. I could focus on doing this thing, whatever that acute crisis is. Maybe that's the only point you have to focus on instead of everything when you're not sure about the people around you. Now, mind you, that only happens when you're, as you've been saying, slowly walking to the crowd, you know, yeah. because if you don't know your people, you're not going to know where best to place them. Um, you know, and, and believe it or not, your people kind of know where they're best at. They yeah. may go to that automatically. And the last thing you want to do is maybe second guess that if they're really good at that. I mean, that's a great way to keep the machine running automatically. And then you just kind of sit back and, you know, um, yeah. you know, deal. Well, with you anything. don't want to tell them to go someplace else. Right. Yeah. Because if they're I, good I at that spot and you tell them to go someplace else like that might throw things off, too. Yeah. I know a lot of people say, well, you have to work on weaknesses and weaknesses guys you know it, it may be the case but sometimes we set, spend so much time working on our weaknesses that we don't develop the strengths that we currently have to excel so i mean there's a balance don't get me wrong i mean but in the end if someone is strong in that area and we're going through this chaotic time 
position your people correctly. And as a supervisor, I think that's less pressure. You know, if you're able yeah. to know your people well and know exactly like, hey, you go here, you go here, you go, you go there. Um, sorry about There's that. a Let's time and a place for development. Yes, 100%. 100%. Yeah. So during those emergency situations, knowing your people the best and knowing how to place them is key. Now, again, guys, this still leans on the supervisor, by the way, <laughs> because you're, you're making an effort to know your people and see where they can be best be positioned. Uh, the other thing I would like to add on top of that is a good supervisor also knows themselves. You know, I mean, it, we're, we, we have to know where our vulnerabilities are. We have to know where our strengths are. You know, if we don't, guys, we tend to put an in, we, we, we tend to impact our team in a negative way. If you don't know who you are and you don't know how you're going to react. I mean, the biggest thing that me and Kanye we talked about is consistency brings confidence. But in order to have as a supervisor now, in order to have consistency and confidence, you yourself have to have self-discipline. I mean, 100 percent. And I, I found out this may help me out. So. I did a video on this recently, but I realized something. Self-discipline can be hard. It is. You know, it could be hard. It's not <laughs> easy. We, we, it's true. It, it could be hard. But I, but I noticed something, though, Connie, and I think you'll agree. As a supervisor, if you connect yourself to a purpose, like I want to take responsibility for my team. I want to help them grow. I myself want to grow. If you connect yourself to a purpose, you know, a, a, a why, that makes it that much easier to connect to that discipline that will start bringing you that consistency and trust in yourself to make those decisions. Now, if you don't know yourself, then you're not going to even trust yourself to make a decision. So right <laughs> off the bat, you have to know yourself, be confident, you know, have some higher purpose when you're doing these things. And through that self-discipline, I, I know this is true, guys. Through that self-discipline, you'll develop the trust that you need to not be afraid to make a decision. Connie, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think the self-discipline is big, right? Um, we talked a little bit about doing like those reviews, right? What went well, what could have went, what we could have did differently, what we could do next time, right? But I feel like it's the same thing when we're doing our own personal introspection, right? In order for us to develop that self-discipline and for us to really know ourselves, we have to be able to take a step back and say, what did I do well? What did I not do? What was I afraid to do? Why was I afraid to do it? Why didn't I make this decision? Why didn't I trust that person or that person's judgment? Like, why did I question this thing? It's like all those things that you have to start to ask yourself. That way you can kind of figure out so what are my vulnerabilities? What are those things that I need to be working on so that I can trust myself to make these decisions so that I can trust the people that I work with and trust their knowledge base and trust their skill sets? You know, but I think a lot of times we're on autopilot and some people aren't taking that step back to reflect, to see where they are, to even develop that self-discipline so that they know next time, all right, so this is this is where you are. This is where you're strong at. This is where you're not. This is who you're going to go to for this thing because you know that that's your vulnerability, right? And you can't be afraid and to, to admit that one, but I think also too is just understanding that that's where your strength is. Your strength is in knowing that Okay, I know I might not be the best at this thing, but if I call this person, this person is almost like my anchor and we're going to get through this. We're going to we're going to get to the mission. So when you say connecting to your why, right, connecting, knowing. So that action, if, if we've got one mission, I know that this is beyond what I'm going to feel or how I'm going to feel less than or how I might feel like I just don't know something, whatever that negative feeling might be. Because now my why is in alignment with the mission. Okay, this is what we're trying to do. I can push that, that feeling aside and go to the person who I know knows the answer. I can go to that person who I know sort of complements my vulnerability. And we're going to still get to the mission, making my why that much stronger and making it easier for me to develop that self-discipline. Yeah, and that why matters because... It gives you that consistency that will help you with that self-discipline. 
You know, consistency will bring confidence. And I think that's the point where you start to trust in yourself to make those decisions. Uh, and again, it comes from, you know, going out of those comfort zones and really testing yourself. And even though we touched on a little bit, I just want to uh, add this as well, more specifically, but we did touch on this throughout the dialogue, but knows how to read the situation. I, I, I believe the only way um, you develop, and we talked about this, is, is going out of your comfort zone, stretching yourself. You know, they say a rubber band is useless until it's stretched. Uh, same thing with us. You know, we have to be able to stretch ourselves and build our, our comfort zones every day. Every day we have to expand our comfort zones. And we only do that by making decisions and, and learning. And the great thing about that is, is as a supervisor, when you're responsible for other people, you have to kind of see the bigger picture. You have to see things that other people can't see. You know, that, that's your job. Uh, and it's not easy. It's, it's, it's not easy at all, but you have to see farther and wider than everybody else. Because in the end, those decisions that you have to make have to really have that bigger picture. And you being as a supervisor, even when you make those decisions, you're making it off a bigger picture, something that you have seen. And, and once, and, and guys, here's the funny thing as a supervisor, once you've seen the bigger picture, you can never unsee it. And you can't claim that you didn't see it. You know, you have to be able to know exactly at the end of the day is this is what's happening. This is what could happen. And this is where I have to get it to be. You know, this is this is what, where I have to go with it. If, if you as a supervisor, you always have to have that compass. You always have to have that direction. You always have to know that we have to head here. Uh, but in the end, if you don't, if you're not learning every day, if you're not making decisions, if you're not stretching that comfort zone, then you don't see the bigger picture. You don't see farther because you haven't even took, you know, have taken a chance to even get that far. You know, as an experienced supervisor, an evaluated experienced supervisor, you know, you, you learn from each thing that you go through, which makes you able to see further and wider. But if you're not doing that, if you're not taking risk, if you're not, you know, taking, you know, making those decisions to learn from, then then your view is very limited. And at the end of the day is, of course, you're not going to be ready to make a decision because you don't have the big picture in mind. So, again, as a supervisor, it's expected that you see further and wider than the people that you supervise. What, what's your thoughts on that, Connie? So I feel like in, in this situation where you have to read the situation, you certainly have to be able to take a moment to step back, right? Because I think a lot of times we feel we have to know the answer. We have to know the answer right now. We have to do it right, right now, right? And sometimes that five seconds, 10 seconds, even if it's just a minute to kind of take a step back and look at what the bigger picture is, that might be the requirement requirement in order for you to feel comfortable in the decisions that you're making. So it's not so much just being indecisive in the moment, because maybe there were different, you know, tactics that you utilized in the past that worked well for you. And in this situation, they don't work, right? And in order to get you to a place where you're feeling comfortable, you've got to be able to understand that bigger picture. And, you know, I hate to say like you need to ask, but sometimes it, you, it's not even asking someone, sometimes just running it by somebody to make sure like you're not missing something can help you to be like, oh, OK, I know what I need to do. Right. Because you might have missed an element that someone else has kind of thrown out there that maybe you never had any experience with it before. So your read of the situation might be a little bit off just because that's something you never experienced before. So, you know, all I would say is that as you're working towards like reading the situation, just know that it's okay if you miss a thing or two, right? Like perfection is not the expectation, right? Like as you're stepping into the role, you're in the role, you're doing whatever you, you can and you have to do in, in these situations, you know, it's not about the perfection. It's about, I'm doing my best to read the situation. I'm making this decision based on the information that I know. And if I need to take a quick pause to just touch base with somebody, maybe the person who held the role before you did, hey, you ever experienced this before? 
it's I'm, and I'm not saying you got time for a long dialogue, right? Because in many instances in our environment, which is very fluid, you don't have time for a long conversation. You might need just a quick insight, and that little bit could help you go a long way. Yeah, Kai, I love what you're saying, especially for those decisions you have to make on the fly. You can't mm -hmm. wait to get 100% of the information. I mean, yep. you literally have to say, okay, 20, 30, 30 is enough. Go. <laughs> enough because you can't wait. You know, we, we talked about that prior. I think that's a great uh, full circle there. We talked about it prior. Like, I'm not, I, 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 I'll figure out what made me jump to that later on. Because in the process, when you're coming up with whatever you could see, your experience is also telling you things. And eventually they meet in the middle. Maybe it's 40% what's going on in the situation matched up with 60% experience and we just go. And then later on when someone says, why'd you make that decision? I'll tell you later. You know, I'll figure out the facts and I'll figure out how that happened later. All I know is this is what brought me to it. But you're right. I'm not spending my time looking to make a perfect solution. I'm not spending my time looking at everything. I'm looking at what I can just enough so I can get moving. You know, I mean, that's, that's in our world. When you have to commit to something really quick, I love... You know, when Connie said perfect, I mean, sometimes people will look for perfection and not act, and that becomes their excuse. Well, I couldn't act because these things here, no, 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 you, you got to act. You know, I mean, part of the, you know, what's funny is part of us moving forward and making a decision is also in an effort to find out what the hell is happening. <laughs> well, yeah, so you're not going to know what's happening if you don't make a decision to get involved and see what's happening. You got to get in there. <laughs> right, and, 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 and you know, I, I want to say this is more good advice is, for those that do freeze, you never know what you can do unless you do it. Yeah. So the more you allow yourself to freeze and become hesitant, that's going to become your foundation. But I promise you, the more you make decisions, each time you go at it and make a decision, however small or whatever it is, not, not afraid to make a mistake, just making a decision, you start building on that confidence. And next thing you know, your comfort zone's a lot bigger, you're stretched out. And, and, and you feel a little bit more trust in yourself. Um, Connie, you have anything you'd like to say in closing? Because I definitely think this is a good dialogue for, for those that, you know, are, are looking to understand how to be better as a supervisor, how to make quick decisions. Because we're only talking today about decision making. I think we covered a, a, a good portion of what I think would help me. I'm sure it would yeah. help you. Yeah, I mean, I think we covered what would be helpful. I mean, the one thing I would throw out there is that if you know you have a manager or supervisor who's decisive, who's indecisive, excuse me, sometimes what you have to do is plan on their indecision, right? So you know you need to have this information by this time, this day, whatever that timeline you're working with. Sometimes it's a matter of, I'm going to go to my manager three days in advance so that we got time for the wishy-washy stuff to flesh itself out. And then when I check back, we'll finally have an answer. Right. So, you know, I don't want us to, to leave without having some sort of strategy on how we deal with that indecisive manager. But I think that it matters that one, we kind of acknowledge those characteristics or those traits that some some leaders have and some leaders don't i think it brings us back to that full circle the the first um i think bullet that anthony put up that talked about you know some of this stuff is nature right some people are born leaders and yes i think that you know that leadership ability can be cultivated and developed over time and such but i i really do feel that you know there are ways that we build trust with the staff. And the more we are decisive, the more we ask questions, the more we gather information, we show them that you know their input matters and we're considering their input in making this decision. Like I feel like that's what helps to build the personal confidence. It builds the self-discipline, but it also builds the confidence that the staff will have in you. And the staff seeing that you're willing to go tap this person, to ask that person, to go to another department, that shows them too. Like you're you're leading by example. Okay, so the next time I'm dealing with a fire, I know all of the people I need to go to. And if I can't handle it on my own, then I'll move it up to the chain of command instead of having a team of people who they come and dump all the problems on you without any solutions or without any efforts to resolve any of the issues that come forward. 
Yeah, I think what we'll do, um, you know, I know maybe later in the week or so, I know you got a busy week. We could discuss. Um, see, the funny thing is, is I'm, I don't know if I'm going to do a topic in what we could do if we have an indecisive supervisor. I think it's more of a, an episode for the supervisor who's indecisive. Because they have to recognize it. Because the sad thing is, is we as frontline could tell them all day, but if they don't know what they don't know, we're not going to get through to them. So I think maybe it's if we have supervisors that are open to learning, because that's another thing. You know, we're doing these episodes for those type of supervisors, but then they don't know that they know they need it. And therefore... Well, they never know, got the feedback, right? Like, because sometimes, feedback. you know, people don't want to say... Like, yo, make a decision. What What's going on, right? Like, And then it's, it's the respect of the chain of command, right? Like, people just won't say anything at all. So, like, sometimes that indecisive manager just doesn't even know that they're being perceived as being indecisive. Yeah, and, and the funny thing is, I, I'm going to title it, like, uh, I don't know, dealing with indeci uh, indeci indecision? Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Dealing yeah. with indecision. So if you're a front line and you feel your supervisor is that way, just send the link to the video and they'll catch it on the title. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's subtle, but I don't know if that's going to get them to watch it. Um, but the key is, I think that's definitely something that would be great to partner with this. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll have that out probably the next one that me and Connie will do. Um, but I think it's more of just, you know, because uh, we talked about qualities that they have. So if you're indecisive, you know, which again, I don't know if you're going to watch this, but these are qualities that will help you become better at making your decisions. So let's do it this way. If you're looking to grow in your decision making, that's what this episode was about. Um, if you're if you're indecisive, then our next episode will be about how that affects the team. Mm. We could do that. That kind of partners a little bit what we said, but we may be able to yeah. venture off a little bit more on more of team growth than uh, trust. Yes. Because if you don't trust in yourself, you can't expect the team to trust you, you know? Um, so I don't know if we officially did a closing outro for Connie. Connie, did we do a closing outro yet? Mm -mm. Yeah, I, I did. I did my final thoughts. Oh, you did? That was your final? Yeah. Okay. And then your podcast, is when's it coming up again? Um, so season three begins probably in another two weeks. Yeah. And I'm, I'm in the first episode? <laughs> Yes, you will be in my first episode. Looking forward to it, guys. And then what we'll do is maybe we'll 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 video. Can we video it as well? And I'll play it as uh, and then I'll play it as a video on Tear Talk too. And then if they want to rest the rest of it, we could uh uh they will get them the, like the, whatever the audio part of it. You know, when you do the next episode, we'll we'll do it on your. But maybe we could do a video. Um, I don't know if we if we can. I'll figure. I'll see if the well, system allows that. I mean, yeah, because when always... I do this, I, I I could I could download audio and video. I will oh, figure okay. it out, um, yeah, but I, I think it'd be it great for you to see the, you know, what what Connie's podcast is about. I and mean, maybe we could actually uh, maybe do a little side thing here. If Connie does the videos, maybe I could post her podcast in a whole little section here, so you guys could check it out. You know, just it'll be her by herself. But I would prefer her behind camera, not audio. My right, people want to see you, Connie. They want to see you, Connie. So they see enough of me. Ah, uh, you never see enough of Connie. Oh um, man. But uh, as always, guys, great show, guys. Uh, hopefully, you know, uh, watching that, we gave you some tidbits on, you know, on how to become a little bit more decisive. It's not easy, guys. I mean, what we do is we give advice. If you could apply it, that's the key. That's the magic of it all is application. Um, but in the end, guys, I think we gave out some solid advice, especially I think the uh, the positioning was pretty good. Knowing your people and knowing where to position them because that kind of helps things run automatic. But knowing yourself. So a lot, lot to take in here, but definitely a good topic. And uh, as always, guys, if you uh, haven't, please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell's good to notify you every time I post a video. Stay safe.